that I will only get seen for a 1% of the 1% of the parts that are out there that are my age bracket or my casting bracket. And then you see, oh, a person that's actually from an English speaking country got that part, even though it is supposed to be like that exactly my casting. And I think that is something that the industry institutionally needs to fix. Mm -hmm. Trying to understand an accent that is not too familiar to you takes a couple extra seconds of processing power in the brain. So when they did the research, uh, they saw that it's easier for the largely American audience, for example, to switch off. <laughs> it is a recipe for burnout. Uh, the, the, the pace of this industry is not sustainable, especially when you operate in the fringes mm. of uh, the big productions or uh, West End, when you're operating in the fringes and you have to make things happen and you have to take on so many roles. You do not need a casting director, you do not need an agent, you do not need funding to just buy. Hi, I'm Andrei Rogozin, and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is a writer, director, actress, my very good friend, Demi Lay. Demi, hi. Hi, Andre. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you for having me. I haven't seen you since last year's summer. Yeah, we need to stop meeting like that. No, we need to start meeting like that more often. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a massive trap when the majority of your friends and the majority of your activities are so intimately connected with your craft. Mm -hmm. It ends up being a thing of if you don't actually have any active projects, mm -hmm. then you just don't see anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when you stop coming to the class at the Working Actors Studio, where we, I think... Uh, <laughs> I am so really. We, we're sorry. Uh, the thing is that we probably are one of the last people who started with Lee six years ago. No. Yeah. Lee it was. Done. No. It was 2018, uh, and I think it was around February or March. It was March. Started. March, yeah. Well, basically, that's it. It's, it was six years ago. I know Dave for six years, and she was always the person who does in one week more things than I do in, like, a year. And then she just runs around like crazy, busy all the time, and she does shit. And then, well, I don't see her for like half a year. <laughs> it is a recipe for burnout. Mm -hmm. If I was to give advice, I would say uh, the, the, the pace of this industry is not sustainable, especially when you operate in the fringes mm -hmm. of uh, the big productions or uh, West End, when you're operating in the fringes and you have to make things happen and you to take on so many roles. Mm -hmm like a producer, writer, director, slash, 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 and then the actor comes last, mm. then it, it, it's, it will burn you out. <laughs> it's great to do it. You learn so many things. But I think the biggest lesson is pacing yourself. Mm -hmm. I was telling you that for quite a long time that you need to take a pause at some point. Did you listen? <laughs> Like, uh, it is so much easier to give the advice. I know, I know, that's, well, that's all I do. <laughs> I never listen, but I do give a lot of advice, especially to people who never asked for it. Like, oh, really? That's what I needed to do, you dumb shit. All right, let's, <laughs> let's go to the very beginning. And I want to ask you. It was snowing the day I was born. You're from Greece, it probably did. It was. It was, right. It was 7th of October and it was snowing. That is the most interesting thing about my life. <laughs> Done. <laughs> no. Okay, the podcast is over. No, look, it's not true. There is a lot of interesting things about you. What I want to know is when have you thought like, oh, that's a good idea. I want a lot of rejection in my life. <laughs> I want to be an actress. 
I think that is a good question because I think I was an entertainer in denial mm-hmm. for my entire life. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, my mother sent me a video from when I was four, when I had forced everyone in the village to put on a play. I, yeah, that, uh, if you're listening to this and there is some screaming in the background, that is my cat. It's a lockdown baby. There is some attachment issues there. We're working through it. Uh, so yeah, basically ever since I was very, very little, I would make up stories. The storytelling mm-hmm. was my favorite thing. I would watch things and then I would expand upon them or I would read something and then I would want to present it to people, but very dramatically. So definitely the um, drama kid uh, essence was already there. However, I did not think that acting was a way of storytelling Mm -hmm. until much later. I always thought that uh, someone would tell an actor, oh, now you have to smile and now you have to be sad. So I never thought it was a creative endeavor Mm -hmm. until I was was in London already. I had a career already in In? technology. Quite good career, actually. Thinking about that, wow, those were the days. Financial stability, am I Mm, right? Yeah, it was sure for the good days, yeah. (laughs) But I was feeling very unhappy Mm. in the tech world, uh, just the normal nine to five and so forth. Uh, So at some point, I was like, what can I do? Oh, I can take a 12 week course on uh, screen acting. That sounded like a good idea. And then uh, the moment I started, it was, oh, you have to create everything. You have the words on a page. Mm. And then you have to make everything come to life through something true. Um, Yeah, it it was a revelation. And since then, it became this bug inside my brain. Mm. More, more. Were you already writing by then or not? I always wrote. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was part of the storytelling. Uh, I would either make up stories and then uh, communicate them verbally to my family, friends, whatever, or I would write short stories ever since I discovered the internet. I discovered Mm -hmm. that people could just write things and publish them. So when it came to storytelling, I think the first stories I was writing was nine or ten years old. What were you writing about when you were small? Usually about the end of the world. Sure, every every little girl's dream. Uh, I would uh, try to, I was fascinated about, uh, well, growing up in Greece, you are... Greek mythology. Exactly, but also you have uh, Christianity. Mm-hmm. And you're constantly bombarded about the, the dead and what happens when you die. And it's a very much more close part to your everyday life mm. than it is in the UK. Do you think it's because it's it's mostly orthodox, right? Yes. Yeah. So I think, uh, because yeah, I mean, I'm originally from uh, USSR. It's the country, kids, that you don't know existed. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I grew up in Latvia, which is mostly Catholic, mm. but my parents are from Ukraine, so my mother was Orthodox. Yeah. My grandmother, my basically my grandparents, my dad is just like me, uh, or not just like me. I think I, I'm just like my dad, I'm an atheist. But, you know, luckily, <laughs> geographically, we were Orthodox. And I think it's, it's very different from, from like, I mean, it's Christianity, but it's still kind of like, it feels like Orthodox Church is more religious than Catholic Church. <laughs> uh, there is so much, like they keep, uh, I, they speak a lot about the guilt of Catholicism. Mm-hmm. But the guilt of Orthodoxy is a completely different kettle of fish. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you are aware of the idea that humans have sinned ever mm-hmm. since you can speak. Mm-hmm. And especially with gender roles, etc., it becomes very convoluted. Mm-hmm. It's like because you're a woman, you have to make up for a lot of shit. 
Well, <laughs> we don't make up the rules. <laughs> <laughs> It's Eve. Oh, let's just blame Eve. I mean, look, she was told, like, just don't touch this don't fucking touch apple. apple. Like, what are you dumb? <laughs> what are you doing? I told you, don't touch it. Why? So, you know, But it's... Yeah, your fault. <laughs> Snakes are quite sexy, so who can play? I wouldn't know, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There is a lot to mm. unpack in mm. the upbringing. There is so many stories. There is uh, the ancient gods. There is the new gods. There is so much mythology around death and around transcending reality and so forth. So growing up with all that plus anime. Mm. Oh, It was a mess. And at what age do you, you discovered anime? Oh, five of us. My, one of my uh, base memories is probably watching Captain Harlock and the main female character just dying. And directly after that, Nafsik, Nafsik, Nausicaa and mm -hmm. the Valley of the Winds, mm -hmm. which is, again, like resurrecting main character, uh, the end of the world through pollution, stuff like that. So my brain was like, That is the everyday struggle mm. I need to tackle. <laughs> At nine. <laughs> At nine. <laughs> nine years old, I'm like, end of the world. And that's, now, you know what, like, the, the funny thing is just, uh, I don't think um, Orthodox Church, Church or Christianity in general affected me that much because like, my, I don't think like, whoop. I was grow growing up in very kind of religious environment in general. It's just like my, my mom, she was like, yeah, I believe in God. Yeah. Like you, you, you'll, you'll get baptized. I'm like, do I need to? Like, yeah, well, they'll give you like a little cross, like a cross. No, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, of course. Uh, like, Bribing your course, way yeah. into church. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. Uh, I lost it somewhere in school, like in kind of like in two weeks. <laughs> uh, but when I started writing, I kind of, I remember like, I, it's not like I'm writing a lot. I can barely write like an introduction for the podcast. But uh, the thing is, like, I also tried writing when I was small, like probably around this kind of same age. I never finished anything until I was probably like 21. At 21, I started writing some oh, short stories. Good, right? I, was, I was writing like fantasy stories. Never. I tried to tackle a novel. Didn't get through. But I know that in general, my short stories were, were, were right. I was, because I was doing, like, I was writing some short stories for uh, the writing competition. Nice. And there was uh, one of the, like, the guy in the jury, one of the members of the jury was um, Sergei Lukyanenko. He's, like, one of the leading Russian fantasy and, and sci-fi authors. Like, in general, like, he, he wrote this, um, the Night Watch. Uh, the movie. The, basically, the movie is based on his book. Oh, you know the movie yeah. that was shot by, by Beckham Better. <laughs> so, Night Watch, Day Watch, and like all this stuff. And he kind of, he was uh, like in the jury and he put my story, short story, like on second place in the group. So, I was like, oh my God, that was so amazing. Obviously, I was writing all my kind of short stories. First of all, it's fantasy. And I was 21, 22. So it's, you know, like you're kind of very kind of maximalist about everything. So yes. everyone died for the very right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, I, uh, I don't even want to start speaking about writing, but writing is the one, <laughs> unlike acting when you're a woman, uh, it's the one thing that you can only improve by getting older and getting more life experience. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, oh, it's a great chapter of my life, but uh, right now this is where I find the most solace and I'm more active in because you do not need a casting director, you do not need an agent, you do not need funding to just write. Yeah, the main problem with that is then like when you wrote it, then you need all those people to like it and to want to sell it and like and to, to publish it or to launch the production with what you wrote because that, that's one of the reasons why I kind of like, you know, I was writing the, the studio like and in general, I know that there were some good bits like I know like I'm not a writer, but I know I could write. The problem with my writing is then I, I need to fix it then <laughs> after I wrote it. And then 
what to do with it next. That's like it's it's everything in this world, like especially in in kind of creative professions. Like they can say, like, well, to act, you need a director, producer, you need to be in something. To write, yeah, you can sit down and write, but then you just wrote it, and now what? That is something I talk uh, like. That is what happens after you write something. So I both write. Um, I write both novels, and I also write plays, screenplays, so forth. Um, what my goal is right now is to just keep writing things that make me happy and self-publish them. So a lot of that. Uh, last year, I wrote about 400,000 words mm. and I published them in open websites where you can get feedback. Mm -hmm. And that was a big investment for me because it just improved my writing and my understanding of what resonates with, with people. Now, the next step, if you want to create a novel, unfortunately, you need to know what sells in the industry right now. And uh, I am part of a workshop of people who are publishers who are, have been published and so forth. And they will say something like, well, if you write mid-grade mid or young adult stories, you cannot write a working class protagonist because this is not going to get published. Hmm. So unfortunately, there is creativity for your own soul and because you enjoy it and creativity that is bespoke to getting published. I think that's kind of, I think it's everywhere. Like, in, in, I mean, you, to be successful, it's very rare cases when someone can be successful without actually thinking about how to sell it. <laughs> and that is, uh, that is an accident in a way because they just happen to create something that there is a space for in the industry at the right time, mm. like flea bugs, stuff like that. I'm not going to even start talking about like personal connections and having privilege behind creating something. But still, I mean, it, it, it plays a role for sure. Yes. But no, I, don't, I don't think like there is too much money to put them into something that's shit only because you know someone. So whatever, like you can, you can like, you can have some connections and people might know you, but the stuff that you do still should be good as Fleabag for example, because I think it's, it's a great series. I think she, she created like amazing series. For me, it is um, the perfect storm that uh, usually needs to be backed by having some kind of um, financial um, freedom. So the freedom to sit back and write something, mm -hmm. the freedom to take the time to start shopping it around, uh, the, the accent you have by being born in a specific class and the way that people react to a pitch, depending on which accent is it made in. Mm -hmm. All of those tiny, tiny things pave the way to success. Well, so going back to why you decided to do it. So, all right, you wrote stories when you were young, but then you moved to London. Uh, where, where, where did you study? I studied two different things. Mm -hmm. When I was uh, in Greece, because that's where I'm from, uh, I studied um, audiovisual arts. So we had script writing, we had uh, how to create comics. Mm. We had a lot of uh, theory and storytelling. It was a very, very fascinating university, a uh, five-year program, actually, uh, that covered so many things you would not see in a single college or university abroad. Uh, unfortunately, because it was such a gamble, it didn't quite work the way it should work, because <laughs> guess what happened in 2008 in Greece? Crisis? Yes. Well, I, I gotta <laughs> tell you, not just Greece. <laughs> we were the first to go down. Mm. Uh, so everything about that program more or less sat down. And that was a good incentive for me to move. By then I was doing some types of performance. I was still three years into the program. I was still not quite clear on what I wanted to do. Uh, and then I moved to Derby in the UK, 
to study contemporary arts. Which says, um, if you want to have a career in something, just have an art degree. And then I decided to do a performing art degree, um, which was fascinating because I went in thinking, I want to paint. I want to be secluded, separated from the external society and just paint in a little cave forever. Probably, again, the Armageddon. Yeah. Uh, probably that as well. <laughs> but also, I was very fascinated by the human, by the human body, by what makes humans tick. I was very enthralled by uh, artists that uh, would create uh, evocative poses by humans, and that would be the storytelling. Yeah. So in the snapshot, you would have the entire, ooh, an image is worth a thousand words and so forth. Uh, so that was my way of storytelling for that time. Uh, and then my tutors were like, so as an industry, we're moving away from painting. Figure it out. <laughs> so I started doing like photo manipulation. I started trying to do like audio mixing because that's skills I had from my previous university. None of them quite satisfied me. And then I started discovering performance art as in you use your own body to convey the feelings that you wanted to convey in the painting that they do not allow you to do because it's not fashionable anymore <laughs> i gosh i love the creative arts industry <laughs> and then you finished it as, a, as, as an actor i uh, know i just was doing a uh, physical theater oh. by the end of it uh I still felt quite self-conscious about my voice because you move to a different country and suddenly you realize that accents matter. Yeah, well, in some, some areas for sure. <laughs> I did not realize that uh, that would be something that would separate me so much from others because I just never thought about accents before I moved mm. here. Uh, it was fascinating. Uh, and then, because I moved to London immediately after, I was thinking of doing an MA. Uh, unfortunately, because of all the situations, financial So you crisis. wanted to do what? An M a, a master's degree. Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, because I, for, uh, I thought for a second, MMA, like mixed, MMA? mixed martial arts. Or oh. Like, oh. <laughs> Damien in a cage? <laughs> that would have been a dream. I mean, that... Could be a movie. I mean, you train a lot, right? So maybe we can, you know, maybe let's let's do a film. Old and fat boxer and young athletic MMA fighter meet and then and rob people <laughs> suddenly. <laughs> and then the end of the world comes. Okay, so master's degree. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to do a master's degree. Unfortunately, that's when they raised the prices about three times for everything so instead i started working all types of odd jobs and then i fell into technology because apparently i could do that what were you doing technology i started doing design mm -hmm. uh, i was doing design for sky uh, and then i was like oh by the way i can also do websites if you want me to and they were like Okay, mm. my space generation, mm. they have all the skills. They ended up going hardcore technology. Mm. Like <laughs> I, I was working to develop the backend systems for the NHS. <laughs> um, yes, I was working uh, on creating apps and uh, forms and all kinds of like complex things that were fascinating to me. There was a lot of problem solving, but um, also it was killing me inside. So at some point I started watching a lot of uh, theater mm -hmm. and it fed the part of me that was absolutely starving for something more than logic. And Eventually, I took on, I, I went, uh, took some classes on acting, realized that it is a very creative way of storytelling and the rest is history. And what was the first uh, class that you, got, you went to? Uh, it was a med film school, mm -hmm. uh, screen acting. It, uh, 
it was quite challenging. Yeah? Yeah. For a beginner or just in general? Um, I think it was quite challenging uh, in general, but also because I was so settled mm-hmm. in my ways. And it immediately was like, okay, we're going to do some deep meditation and then you're going to talk about uh, your dreamscape straight to the camera. And I was there going like, what's in the Kumpa fucking yeah shit are you talking about? <laughs> I want a script. Uh-huh. Yeah. And yeah. So just, just give me things to say and I'll say it. <laughs> you want me to say something from me? And then in the end, I was like crying mm-hmm. and having straight up hallucinations that I was back in my parents' house, <laughs> just full on therapy session. And he's like, okay, this sucks, but also I feel something. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I felt anything in such a long time. Really? <laughs> you, did, you, you you were bottling your emotions before? Like, oh gosh, yeah. yeah. Because I was quite a, an extroverted person back in Greece, but being extroverted uh, in a business environment in the UK has different rules. Yeah. So there was so much... You, you become a fractured personality when you move. I mean, honestly, I don't know about you, but uh, I noticed that I am just a general and different person when I speak English. It's weird because and it's not like I'm, I thought about like, is it, is it, I'm not trying to block some parts of me. It's just, I'm just going to be different. It's, With my friends, when I speak Russian, I'm going to be more loose in a way. And I don't know why. It's not like I don't want to be like more like more serious because you know. No, it's just like it's just I don't know. It's just different. <laughs> there are parts of it that uh, there's different parts of your brain that uh, light up when you're speaking a different language. Mm-hmm. Well, th- there's nothing lights up here <laughs> for, for a while. Yeah, maybe the light is very deep inside. Yeah, maybe it's so deep inside. It's like it's another part of the body that but you know. Also, there is. Um, there is the slight social clues uh, that you see because UK is such a hierarch- hierarchical system. Mm-hmm. It's such a very strict class society. And uh, a lot of the times th- there's a lot of um, unspoken communication. And for example, in Greece, the majority of the communication is spoken mm-hmm. directly, out loud. Awful. Yes. And then you go to a more covert society and then you start picking up some hints and you cannot really translate them. And you're like, I'm putting the effort to create a relationship or a communication with a person. And if I was speaking in Russian or in Greece, in Greek, that person would probably react in a certain way. And now I'm doing the same exact thing. I'm being authentic and I'm putting the effort and that person is not responding to it so slowly you start becoming more unsure about what you are what you're saying how you should say Mm. yeah i think so i think i think i definitely look (laughs) i definitely had things said when i just like started working here like with you know like in english speaking collectives that i knew for sure and i did say some some stupid stupid jokes in Russian to my colleagues before and I knew that it wasn't offensive and they weren't offended because they first of all they knew like he's a clown he wants to make us laugh and like there there were like some things that like could be here considered a little bit inappropriate you know that's what you said the the, the, the different culture and everything is like it's like and I know that when I just started working here in you know English speaking environment and just in general like with different mentality I remember that I said I said a couple of jokes. I don't remember exactly what like, but there were like a couple of jokes that later I thought like, yeah, that's that that you shouldn't say things like that here, because people will not understand that you're like you're not you know, bad man. <laughs> you're just trying to make people laugh, including the people you're talking to, and that's maybe a little bit. But I I just know hundred percent that like people who work 
before back in like in Latvia or even here when I just moved to London for a year I was working in the Russian visa application center and most of the people who worked there were from uh, Lithuania, Latvia, some were from Russia, some were from Ukraine, Belarus. So basically like all people from kind of Eastern Europe. And we kind of we still have kind of the same mentality. I know that like they all knew that ah, Andre is just a joker. He's like he just like it's funny. No one, no one ever was offended at me for kind of the same things. And then now I understand like, yeah, it's it's very different here. Like you need to kind of correct yourself a lot. That probably kind of changes your behavior and when you kind of you know speak English and also I mean look it's like I know that my English now is much better than it was when I just came here but I still kind of have to think a little bit longer than I would do in Russian so and I think maybe at some point when you kind of you need like this extra millisecond to think about something so you kind of think more about what you're saying and then at some point you're like yeah I shouldn't just say that probably so there's no point it's, it's, there's no no valuable information coming out of my mouth right now so I'll just I'll just stop talking. It is really hard because I see this so much. Because, okay, London is 50% multicultural. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit easier in London. Uh, the people you will meet on the everyday are perhaps more used to seeing a person that English is not their first language. And I do understand that to coexist, with all the different cultural backgrounds in the same city, there is a little bit of behavioral adjustment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That you do not want to be the person that is unconsciously abrasive or makes other people feel a certain way. And that was me for a while. Like I did not realize that my directness was actually rubbing people the wrong way. (laughs) So I do understand that to a certain extent. Yeah, it's great to... Uh, be smoother, mm-hmm. become more of a part of the whole. But because it is so unspoken and quite insidious in the UK, the way that your accent or the way you express yourself will define you. Mm-hmm. There is a part of it that oversteps the, okay, I'm becoming part of the culture now. I understand the joke, the humor, the timing. But there will always be a part of it that's like, you're not one of us. <laughs> I mean, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, for some people, yeah, for sure. I'm talking more about like Just, institutionally. Mm-hmm. Because absolutely, like, I. I uh, okay. I love a lot of the British people. <laughs> and they have managed to cope with an ever expanding cultural revolution or whatever it is when suddenly your country is no longer monocultural, but like multicultural uh, in an amazing way. And Mm -hmm. there are organizations and companies that absolutely cater to people who, for who English is not their first language, but also there are organizations that will try to do everything to make sure that you do not penetrate their holy land. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, I think. But yeah, in general, I think I, uh, I almost never, like there were, there were some kind of cases of, you know, people like, oh, your Eastern European friend, blah, blah, blah. I, I mean, but in general, I think people here are welcoming. I think just... In general, in the world, people, no matter what's happening, uh, what kind of shit your country does or did, every country did some shit. Uh, But when you come meet people, they kind of welcome you on a personal level. It's more, uh, what I find is I never had issues in technology. In technology, uh, it was agnostic. It's like, you can be wherever you want to be from, I don't care, make sure your code is, uh, has comments, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And then you go to a profession that is considered more of a status symbol, like acting or writing. And that's where the doors become to close, uh, start to close. Um, That is when it becomes an institutional situation where equity tries quite 
equity tries its best mm. uh, with the foreign-born actors uh, branch. And there is some surveys and some research that says, for example, 14% of uh, doctors and nurses uh, were not born in the UK, have heavy accents, basically. And in every iteration of a TV show or a theatre play in the last few years, that was 0% of actors mm. that were foreign-born. Hmm. It's just, well, I mean, I'm just curious why, because I'm pretty sure that most of the creators of the TV shows and like they want, I want to believe most of them want their product to look as close as possible to real life. So why they don't think about that? Is it just like because they just don't think about it? I don't, I don't, I don't think that someone sits there like, I will write this nurse British because <laughs> it is easier to consume content that is as standardized as possible. Mm. Trying to understand an accent that is not too familiar to you takes a couple extra seconds of processing power in the brain. So when they did the research, uh, they saw that it's easier for the largely American audience, for example, to switch off if they are listening to someone that has an accent. Interesting. It is a lot, a lot of trying to make something that is as profitable straight out of the gate as possible. Now, you get people like Mads Mikkelsen. And I believe that Mads Mikkelsen is arguably one of the best actors of our generation. He is very good. Uh, indeed, yes. One of the best actors of our generation. <laughs> I noticed that a lot of women I, I know really think that. <laughs> and Top three. No, he, he's great. He's great. Honestly, he's great. I gotta say, I haven't seen a lot of his stuff like, you know, he's Swedish, right? Or Danish. 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 I didn't see a lot of his stuff, you know, from his homeland. I never noticed. Does he have strong accent? Extremely strong accent. I never, like, honestly, for me, every time when I, when I watched him in the film, I never even paid attention. Like, I never even kind of, like, it never crossed my mind, like, oh, this dude has an accent. No, I was just like, oh, let's make sure. Because he <laughs> was denied so many auditions yeah. and parts because of his accent. And, and until, basically, he, Brian Fuller got him on Hannibal. Mm -hmm. And that was because of a personal recommendation of someone who had worked with him in a different show. No, but look, look, he was, before Hannibal, he was in Hollywood. He was like, was he, Hannibal happened after he, Cinderella for sure. No? He was always playing the part of the foreigner. Yeah. Well, if you have an accent, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Why does it have to be the stereotypical part? Well, uh, because as you know, everything that is, everything that we know about other countries is a stereotype. Because in Armageddon, a Russian cosmonaut wears Shapka Ushanka, the, like the little Ushanka hat, and fixes everything with, you know, like, back and, and, and just drinks vodka and he wears this, like, the, the, the tank to, I don't know, like, I think it was, like, it was just offensive. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Every time, but, like, it, it, now, now, I think they will kind of, Ukrainian people will be shown in the series and films with more respect. But before, it was the same. <laughs> All of it. So that's why, like, oh, most of the additions I do is like evil Russian bandit Ivan, or or evil KGB, or FSB, or like with like another like, Russian soldier, just because I speak Russian. That's it. <laughs> and I completely understand that uh, before you are trusted with a bigger part, mm. you have to cut your teeth on smaller parts. And we are now looking for the very authentic accent. So. Now, whenever we do like the small parts, 
they go to the person that has exactly that accent. Well, yeah, no. Exactly. <laughs> but when it's the other way around, it doesn't work that way. When they make a series about Greece, mm-hmm. when they make a, a, a play, multiple plays mm-hmm. in the National Theatre that are tragedies, do the audition with people that have Greek accents? <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> No, I mean it depends. It depends what kind of what exactly they're trying to show. Because when uh, Craig Mason did Chernobyl, he and it was like in Ukraine, most of the people kind of like in Soviet Union were speaking Russian at that point, and Ukrainian as well. But I think like it was almost like international, um, you know, set in kind of international environment, Soviet international environment. Mm-hmm. Most people were, would be speaking Russian, obviously. And he said, like, we're not doing Russian accent. And I think he was right, because he should, like, everyone speaks English in the series, but they kind of consider, like, they kind of, they would be speaking Russian. Why would they speak Russian with an accent? So when they speak English, Mm -hmm. they just speak clean English. Like, there is no way, like, why would they... All speak the English, English but with Russian the accent. accent. It, yeah. it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, the same way that the, it was done in, I think it was Child Forty Four with Tom Hardy. They were they were talking with really strong, stupid Russian accent. It's like really why everyone in this country speaks their own language with accent. I don't know how to fix that problem. What I would like is opportunities, basically, because. I completely understand all the arguments. I completely understand, oh, there needs to be more legibility. Oh, we need to make it accessible to the majority of the English-speaking world who is more attuned to a specific English accent. I don't know about that because I'm not sure. And I, like, I don't have official statistics about that, but I have spoke to quite a few of my friends who are not... Um, their native language is English, who came here, and most of them, including me, said that we actually understood foreigners in the beginning way better when they spoke English rather than actually British people. Because foreigners, like even though you have those very different accents from different parts of the world, but we kind of still, it was kind of the same for us. Like, yes. And it's very different. (laughs) And that's what I'm trying to say. The experience we have as Europe, the others Mm -hmm. who speak English as a foreign language, we understand each other better. Mm -hmm. And the people who have English as first language understand each other better. And the majority of the material that is created in the English speaking world goes English speaking world first, export second, and they have trained the rest of us to accept it as it is, which is fine. And then there's the questions of like, oh, why don't you go back home and have a career there? <laughs> and all of that is completely understandable because yeah. of course it's your country and you want to have more opportunities. Uh, I think where my point of view is, is um, drop the lower the standard, lower the access, just a tiny little bit, mm-hmm. because taxation without representation is not a fair thing. Wow, civil war we started. Uh, my main, um, you have all the acting schools, you have all the agents, you have all the people you pay a lot of money to, to improve your accent. And they all take your money. And they all say, yeah, you are going to be seen for auditions. But then when you actually speak to the casting directors, they say, oh, I can hear 1% of a different accent in your accent, so I would never hire you for that part. And the big question becomes like, is it even possible at all to be hired for anything apart from Ivan, the mm-hmm. evil mafia guy. Yeah. Which I, again, to be fair, I wouldn't mind. No. What I don't understand, and it happened, I will not say name the project, but there was a project when I was like, 
I was auditioning for Russian prison guard. And they even liked the auditions because they, they asked about my availability at some point, but then like they said, no, no. And then I'm watching the film. And then there is the guy who who's got the part. He doesn't speak Russian. Because he was trying to say something in Russian. And they kind of like, we're looking for Russian speakers. And that was Russian. It was like, I could barely understand what he said in only, only. Because I auditioned for that part. Yeah. And I was like, how is that like, and okay, maybe, maybe not me, but I know, I know three more people who auditioned for that role. And it's tiny role. It's just like two sentences. None of that, none of us would ruin the film if they would cast us, but they decide to cast someone who doesn't speak, right? It, that's that what kind of a little bit kind of brings me down some that. Because you know what? I'm right. I could play Russian bandit Ivan. For the rest of my life. Obviously, at some point, maybe I would want something more, but like, I'm ready, but come on. <laughs> but also there are Russian bandits. There are no great random people. Yeah, in I think I think in this case, even though I'm not even Russian, I'm Russian speaking Ukrainian from Latvia, born in the USSR, living in London. It's I'm, like, I have more representation. Exactly. <laughs> It's true, yeah. And that is where it becomes uh, a big question of like, what are you doing with your life? Because uh, I just need to know that it is possible. Mm -hmm. And again, you go into the whole, why was, was I not picked for that one thing a year that I have an opportunity to get? Because that is, that because my limitations mean that I will only get seen for a 1% of the 1% of the parts that are out there that are my age bracket or my casting bracket or something I would be suitably, vis visibly suitable for, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then it becomes such a trip of like, why did I not get that? Yada, yada, yada. And then you see, oh, a person that's actually from an English speaking country got that part, even though it is supposed to be like, that exactly my casting and i think that is something that the industry institutionally needs to fix i think so yes i think in this case like because i do understand when it's like it's a bigger part and they need a name for example a name like bigger name someone who will bring people to the cinema who can do decent accent of whatever accent they, they're doing and if they're doing decent accent by the way I, I have no problem with that because I think Florence Pugh, she did great Russian accent when she was playing like the, the sister of uh, what, what was her name? Black Widow, yeah. uh, whatever. My main question is how is a person who's foreign born going to have access to those opportunities and to the training, the, the multi-million dollar mm. training that the people who had the easy opportunities early on are afforded. I want to see a few examples mm -hmm. of people who were able to do it the hard way and succeeded before I can say, yeah, this industry is, is not basically um, blacklisting us. Mm. Because that's what it feels like. It feels like that no matter how good you can be, how mu no matter how much you put the effort in, you put the training in, you... My job is acting 24-7 at this point. Uh, and you get so much training, like you pay your dues. But then after you have paid your dues, is it even 0.0001% possible mm. to make it to the two uncredited parts? Yeah, I I know what you mean. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> so, so industry. Yeah. Tell me. <laughs> I mean, I'm just I'm just curious why is that? Because it feels like in some cases creators don't really care that much about this stuff. It's just like because like they have a story to tell. Yes. And there that's just like a tiny little part of the story. Like your 
little character with a couple of lines that kind of 90% of the world or 95% of the world will never know the difference between the accent that they do or like what they say in your particular language. So it's kind of like, yeah, we have a bigger fish to fry. So we need to think more about like this bigger part, like this, like we were looking for the main part for a long time. So I guess that's one of the reasons because it's just, it's not that important. Not that important as it is for us. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I do believe that it is um, prejud uh, prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> wow, accent and legibility. I do not know how to say the word prejudice. I suppose I do not deserve an opportunity in this industry. <laughs> Why would they create a word that has all those consonants together? <laughs> that just sounds uh, structurally wrong. Prejudice. Well, you know, the way you say it, it's cuter. <laughs> prejudice. I think the problem with the industry is prejudice. <laughs> I mean, uh, I was talking to, about that with my agent and she said like, yeah, I mean, I do understand there like, there will be most of the jobs that you will kind of apply now uh, would be this like, you know, stereotypical yeah. roles. Uh, she said like, I, I, I can see that the industry is changing and more creatives are trying to tell actually authentic stories of not just, you know, British people, but like everyone, because come on, London, London, London. Yes. if you're casting for someone's boyfriend or girlfriend mm -hmm. in London, yeah, the chances are, are that they are not going to be British porn. Yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> both of them. Maybe none of them. <laughs> maybe, maybe the whole 10 people in the series and, and none of them are British. <laughs> and it is not uh, us versus them. Yeah, because. Unfortunately, I think I am more British than I am Greek at this point. Yeah, I know. You know what? It's it's so weird because I'm kind of going back to Latvia sometimes now, and I talk to my friends. Like, and I go to the show, for example. It's not like I'm not trying to say that Latvia like is a bad country and it's everyone country. in the country is rude, but like there, like people are there. They were like they're tougher a little bit. More direct, and sometimes, sometimes, it's not just direct. Sometimes they're rude, and you come to the shop and you ask something. So, like someone who works in the shop, you ask them something, and they're just like, and you're like, "What? The fuck? Come on!" I, like I just, I ask you shit that you should know. It's your job, and you're being rude to me. And then I talk to my friends, and they're like, "Yeah, you're a snowflake. You lived in, in, in the UK for ten years. Now you come back as a snow a snowflake here." I'm like, "Well, there's no reason to be rude." Because it will never, it will not make, like, I can understand being rude to someone who's being rude to you. But being rude to someone just like for no reason will not make you feel better or them feel better. Why? And they're like, yeah, like the snowflake go back to UK. At this point, we are culturally British. We are broken. We can we, you cannot give us back. You cannot return us. Please <laughs> keep us. <laughs> Please keep us. I've lived. Okay, let's let's do it like that. Okay. I've lived my entire adult life in the UK, and that was fifteen years. <laughs> so I am a British sixteen year old. I'm a sixteen year old child. That is fully British at this point. Yeah. I know. I, I'm, I'm moaning a lot about it, but I feel like this is a structural issue. Like when you have like a trial, and uh, there's a lot of things that do not go perfectly well. Mm -hmm. It still can continue, and you can still be like, "Oh, I'll fix this. I'll fix this at the closing argument." Blah blah blah. But there are some issues that are structural, meaning that the entire trial has to be stopped, mm -hmm. and then brought together again by prosecutor, etc. I read a lot of true crime. <laughs> so for me, even though I've grinded away in the industry for the past six years, really, I feel like that is kind of um, the line in the sand that feels like this is your limit. You can do immersive theatre to a certain extent and only certain parts. Mm -hmm. You can do commercial audition. 
And then anything more than that, unless you are creating the whole product, we will choose someone who checks more boxes over you. And I have been said that directly by people who do casting, by producers. They're like, oh, this is great. Everything you do is great. But the fact that I can still hear something different in your accent means that one of the top three boxes will never be checked. It's uh, honestly for me, it kind of even feels a bit weird because I do understand that neither of us will ever play a British person. But it feels like, don't you want it to be more authentic? So if a Greek girl plays a Greek girl in the series and has an accent, of a Greek, it kind of should be better. I mean, it's... It's just a lot of... uh, Going back to how I started writing, when you start writing, you write archetypes. Mm -hmm. You write what you know. And especially with novel writing, uh, fiction writing, it becomes a lot of reclaiming own voice. But that also means that a lot of People who are British, they try not to write people from other, from other cultures. Mm-hmm. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of, uh, okay, I have this series that takes part, part in London and I will have um, maybe a person that has uh, Afro-Caribbean descent and maybe one of our writers will be able to write about them uh, and maybe one of the creators will be uh, sharing that heritage as well. And then it starts being wide enough. But like this one project will only cover this specific non-white British uh, origin story. uh, This very, very narrow lens of not just monocultural representation. I understand that most of the stories in Britain will be told by British people, about British people, it makes total sense. Yes. But when the, there is an opening for someone who is not British, it would be nicer if this opening would be given to an authentic re- re- represent- the representative. Rep- <laughs> yeah, representative. Do you see? That's why we don't, we don't, we don't get cast. And give us uh, the jobs. We will try to say like 90% of the words. Yeah. And then like if we mispronounce the word, it's even cuter like this. Uh, but basically, yeah, it's, it's, it's like it's better when uh, it goes to representative of that culture rather than someone who is has nothing to do with it. And that's one of the things that I want to talk to you about that they say a lot. You want to get the job, create a job. And you did that. I mean, you uh, directed and you wrote and you produced your play. And that's what I wanted to talk as well. Can you walk me and our viewers through the process of how actually easy it is. I had to start therapy after that. Seriously? There's ways to do it that are um, easier than the way you've done it. Can we (laughs) we go through the way you've done it? uh, And then maybe point by point, you could tell people how to do it in an easier way. Yeah. Okay. So you wrote a play. By the way, I just want to remind you and everyone else that you, well, hopefully you watched the episode with Matt, who played Mike in Demi's play Sea Between. But I was the original Mike because we did a piece of that play in the showcase from Working Actors Studio. And I played Mike in, uh, I think it was the end scene. It was not Mike. No? When I, when I, no, I mean, of course, the name was different when I played him, but I was the original asshole. <laughs> and it was such a shame that um, 
You're not actually an asshole. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing it then. <laughs> <laughs> I will forever remember that uh, day before we actually had the showcase yeah. where I dragged you uh, <laughs> to a side street of Camden, <laughs> a stub alley, um. and I had you stand at the one end of the street and I was at the other and it was like, let's do the fight scene yeah. and now scream at me, yeah. call me names. We were, so basically, like, the problem uh, that I work at sometimes, that sometimes I'm not, like, when I, I'm on the stage, I need to project more. I need more volume, more voice. And uh, it was basically, we did a rehearsal, and in, in an hour or so, we had to basically start the performance. And then we went, like, and it was, yeah, it was Camden, Camden Town, and we went, went to the site found like a quiet street and we just like yeah and we rehearsed a distance and there were people just going and we were like looking at us like what the fuck is going on Those like, and there, was, like there was a lot like a lot of the lines like well I like yeah well I'm pregnant now like what like well I'm not but I could be like what that's fucked up and then people like yeah it's kind of it kind of is <laughs> it was fun <laughs> in all fairness I really enjoyed it yeah. Um, yes. So basically, that was part of the process of the creation of the play. I had written, I had written quite a lot before that. I was writing short scenes for people for like their um, show reels. Uh, I had written a short plays. I was part of production companies that did twenty-four hour plays. So quite often, I would write a play in less than twenty-four hours. Uh, so. It's like a whole play. 20 minutes. Okay, well, still. I mean, still, it's a lot of, lots of typing. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, experience that you need to gain by doing something. I wrote a pilot, a whole uh, six episode miniseries back with Rene. Uh, so I was doing a heck lot of writing. I did some writing for the showcases of the Working Actors Studio before that. And then eventually I came up with this more, oh, write what you know kind of story where it was specifically about a Greek woman um, and her relationship with a British man, because that was a very specific topic that I was familiar with. Uh, right, what you know, right? Exactly. <laughs> of course, it's not... Uh, it's not biographical, it's uh, very... Inspired. Exactly, like heightened, uh, romantic drama, mm -hmm. you know. And I felt like it would be a very low-risk investment because if you write a 200 with just two actors, then it is a much easier affair. Uh, I wrote it, I wrote segment first. Uh, we worked on it in the showcase together, which was really good because Lee was directing it. Yeah. Lee Lomas. Yeah. Uh, we presented it. We had a really good feedback. And then um, while I was still working, oh my gosh. I actually had written a full play before that that was supposed to go on stage on the 3rd of March, 2020. Yeah, it wasn't a good month, it wasn't a good year. I'm still recovering from that shit mentally. So mm. a lot of the story was cannibalized from that earlier play. Mm -hmm. Anyways, so after we presented it uh, December in that showcase, uh, I completely invested my own money. Um, to get the director, the actor on board, uh, book two nights at a small theater, uh, buy all the props, the clothes, and pay for the rehearsals. So I've inv I invested a chunk of money, let's say up to 1K, uh, to have like, six rehearsals, eight rehearsals as a full play. Uh, a lot of it was, which we're just rehearsing at my house, you know. Um, 
And it was good. But at the same time, we're talking about one hour long play um, with six rehearsals. It's quite challenging. And the biggest challenge for me was that I had to do the acting. But I also was the writer. I also had to, a lot of the parts of my brain were on all different things instead of working on my acting. So that is, yeah, create your own work, but also you're not going to be performing at your best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless you magically find a way to outsource the work to others, you are still going to be the person who just does everything. Yeah. And it's hard. Yeah. I mean, honestly. Printing even, flyers. Even with podcast, <laughs> like, I do understand that there are like hard areas right now that I haven't covered yet. And I just understand, like, I just don't have enough time. And with the play, I can't even, even kind of imagine how much stuff you need to do. It's like, it's basically you're doing everything. But the leader the, the first run, the first two, yes. yeah? We had a limited amount of rehearsals with mm -hmm. Lee, though, because it was uh, uh, it's, it's scheduling issues. Lee was just coming back to directing. Like, I had, <laughs> bless his heart, I don't think he was, like, focusing on directing at that part of his life. He was, because he was absolutely working on acting and having the studio and having a million other things. So it was very much a favor. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's completely a thing. Like, we didn't have a producer, so I had to do all of the things of um, figuring out who will do the engineering, the tech, mm -hmm. uh, figuring out uh, how to do all the social media promotion, figuring out, like creating, doing all the photo shoots, uh, asking favors for people to help me with photo shoots, asking favors for people to help me with the sound design, this, that. And then it becomes kind of like this mountain of things. And basically in this, like this, on this level, it's you're finding the venue yeah. You are responsible to a degree to filling the venue with people, right? And because it was so unknown, I had to pay for the venue. A lot of people do profit share, mm -hmm. but I had to pay an insane amount of pro up front. How, how, like, do for people who don't know how it works, because as I say in almost every episode, I obviously know everything. But for people who don't know how the profit share works with theaters, with venues. It's all very nebulous. <laughs> it always depends on uh, the venue. It really, it's, it's a networking business. Hmm. So if you know someone who knows someone who knows the owner of this, or if you have been involved in that production that was there, blah, blah, then you can just pick up the phone and say, oh, I have this pitch it. Pitch the idea. Pitch, oh, how many people will be there? How many people do I expect uh, that will come? Uh, will it be an easy production? And so forth. And then after you had like a production meeting, if they're even interested in having it on, then um, they will usually say something like 70-30 or 50-50 if you're lucky at first. So the venue will keep 70% or 50% of the profits. And then if for some reason you have an amazing relationship with them, it could be like 40, mm -hmm. 60 or something. Which with small venues, I kind of, I feel like that the 40% from the profit will barely, if, if even covers the, the spend, like all the spendings that you need to pay to produce the play, right? <laughs> It does not cover it. It doesn't cover it. Mm -hmm. So basically, you only, you, you're you doing it in the name of art. <laughs> Why would you do a fringe play? It, uh, if you're not... For credit? That was back in the day when Spotlight made it quite hard to get mm -hmm. on Spotlight. So, yeah, for sure. Um, stage experience is extremely important. Mm -hmm. I do believe that 
the actors that I rate the most have had a lot of stage experience. If you want to know if you want to be an actor, it might be a good idea to have a relatively long run because uh, it teaches you a lot about the trade. It, but the audience, you, you get to experiment, you get to see what works and what does not work almost in real time. There is a lot of benefits of being an actor in a theatre production. Are there any benefits at creating your own work? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it depends. Yeah. Like if you yes. want to continue creating your own work, you need to start with something. I don't think anyone will let you into the, you know, like national theatre. Like before you did five, ten, twenty small plays in the French. There are easier ways. We'll, we'll get to easier ways. ways. <laughs> so... <laughs> so you were doing all this by yourself, basically. Lee was helping you with directing. Direction. And he really helped me with his experience as well, because there are so many things you don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would be like, oh, did you, did you arrange that? And I was like, oh, I have to, oh, someone has to remove all the set on the last <laughs> day of the run. <laughs> Yeah. Obviously, it just disappears. Uh, don't the magical fairies take it away? <laughs> oh, I have to. They, they do. You have to call them, though. <laughs> oh lord! Okay. And how did it go? The first one. Oh, the first one was great because you still had a lot of friends who had not seen you on stage yet. So we had a sold out run. It was uh, a weekend. It was in uh, Chetra Theatre, Camden, love it. Black box theatre. I am such a black box theatre kind of person because... And by black box, that means it just literally like a box that is really black. <laughs> 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 it's, a, it's a black box with seats and that's it. <laughs> there are people who love theatre for the production. Mm -hmm. I am the person who's like, give me two chairs and two fantastic actors and I am delighted, mm -hmm. you know, good sound design, good lighting, great. I just, I'm not the big kind of set kind of person. And that's when you find out that a lot of the reviewers and a lot of the people who go to watch theatre want that. Mm -hmm. But that's a different story for another time. <laughs> uh, so that was a weekend. It went great. Uh, it was sold out, I think, those days. So that was fantastic. We had a lot of very interesting feedback. And then I was thinking, okay, what are the next steps? The next steps are probably to put it at, uh, up uh, on a festival like Fringe, Camden Fringe. The next steps would be to have a longer run. Uh, the next steps would be maybe to rewrite some parts because I was still feeling quite insecure about my writing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is something I would not recommend doing. <laughs> being secure about your writing or yes. just all of it? <laughs> uh, it was a very, very, very bad timing. Mm -hmm. We became part of Camden Fringe in the year that uh, had the most shows on and the least amount of audience. <laughs> it was just an amazing combination. <laughs> Post-pandemic, the very beginnings again of the cost of living crisis, people were still very unhappy about being in enclosed spaces and also I'm sorry to say that but Camden Friends gave us nothing mm. the only thing we got from Camden Friends was that we were on their website zero promotion mm. zero and you have to pay to be part of Camden Friends and through Camden Friends we went to Cockpit which um, again unfortunately was not able to really help us with promotion. with promotion but they also were would only let us book the venue with a lot of money up front mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we had to share the venue every night with another show so there was it was one of the most stressful situations ever we worked really hard to create the sets. We had a new director that uh, was um, able to put more, more, more time. So we spent, uh, Vittorio Pari, we spent so much time rewriting, reworking the material, adding different themes, trying to discover different avenues in which it would 
potentially become more interesting again you're interesting enough don't try to become more interesting lessons learned so Matt was fantastic being very available for rehearsals trying out new things trying out new structures uh having to redesign the whole show for the different venue that was quite challenging it, we learned so much from it and then directly after that we had a three week run uh and that was extremely challenging because we had already reached out to every everyone who knew us personally or through work mm-hmm. had already seen the work so then how do you feel a theater for three weeks when you have no marketing budget and when you don't have any of the reviewers necessarily really interested on the subject because it's just a romantic drama like it does not have a specific attention grabbing thing and that's when i learned from a lot of other fringe writers and creators that actually you have to create for the industry Mhm. Yeah, if you think if you want to put all this effort put it in something that would be interesting for the press. Like you're creating something already anyway so try to take the boxes. Yeah. <laughs> Which kind of sometimes makes sense but that's like the thing is sometimes good story can be just a good story. I know. And it will be interesting enough. But do you think it's it's really based on what people are coming to watch, or is it more like people who produce things think that people will not going to watch this? It's very difficult because we are talking about fringe theater. Mm-hmm. There is no trust in that. Oh, I'm going to go watch something in a pub theater. And it's going to be good. Who are the consumers of fringe theatre apart from friends of the actors and creators? You have to be lucky enough to choose a pub theatre that has an inbuilt audience, mm-hmm. and that's when you have to know the borough, when you have to know the neighbourhood. Mm-hmm. If you are working with Highbury in Islington or something like that, that's actually really good mm-hmm. because they are um, quite middle class. And they have a media theater, and the majority of the people there are patrons of media, so they are quite open to see what the King's Head Theater has on, or what the Hope Theater has on, or the, what the Hen and Chicken Theater has on. But you need to know the audience and cater to them. They will be more likely to want to watch classic things or period pieces, so it becomes a quite big. You need to be your own researcher constantly, and to have any kind of career. Can you have a career in fringe theatre? Probably not. It does not pay the bills. Or uh, well, I mean, career in fringe theatre sounds like there are there really people who have like full on careers in fringe theatre. I thought like it's mostly people who are serious about uh, the industry, like are kind of starting in fringe and trying to. Mo move somewhere from fringe or like uh, one of the directors I was uh, I was kind of involved in his plays, but he's like that's all he does. Like he just like fringe uh, Russian speaking theater. He was mostly doing Russian speaking before. Now he switched back to English, but he was kind of like it's mostly just like he just does a play, fringe theater, like you know, like small run. Uh, Three to six performances, and then he. I'm not like some of them are not even. I'm not even sure how he does it. Like where he gets the money for it, because for some of the runs were kind of successful, ish to a degree. But again, like it's still fringe. You're, you can't make so much money. They're like, oh well, now I can like. Ah, I have like six months of doing nothing. No, he was just like he 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 doesn't play. He work, works on it for like a month or so, does a play, goes away with his wife, with his wife somewhere like in Europe for like a few days, comes back, does the next one. That's all he does, all the time. And I mean, like that could be considered as a 
career fringe theater but like it's like fringe theater and career like they kind of don't like it's hard to mention because words in the same sentence fringe theater is um, a massive net mm -hmm. that uh, catches so many different cases and scenarios I know why actors do fringe theater because they won't have credits they want agents to see them they want to have their reviews and they want the practice well, the yeah. experience the joy of being on stage yeah. right um, there's a lot of downsides in being an actor that does French theatre because that is the other side of the coin. Why do the producers and the directors do it? And the writers. Mm -hmm. And the writer directors. Writer director producers. Writer directors. Writer directors. You should never be a writer and director at the same play. Why? The blind spots accumulate. Mm -hmm. That there is a, a great benefit from having a different pair of eyes. Someone might want to do directing in French theatre because they just enjoy theatre and they just want to do it as a hobby. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the things. Like, the, I think a lot of this is just someone who kind of, I think, I'm not sure, maybe it's not true, but I, I feel like, like people who work in French all the time. Maybe some got stuck, maybe some of them actually just enjoy this. But I think a lot of the, those people, they, they have full on careers in like some other areas. Yeah. But that's like the potential that they want to kind of to explore and they have the passion for it. And that's that's all they have time for. And that's enough for them because it's like, I mean, I mean like who cares if fringe or not fringe? It could be like amazing, could be shit. You can see some shitty place on main stages of country, <laughs> any country. <laughs> exactly. You just it's like a lower risk investment. Mm. Just an opportunity to actually do what you want. Mm. Now the problem with that is that the quality becomes so inconsistent that there is uh, as long as you have like 1k anyone can do it. Which says a lot in that era and that time but uh, that is why it's very very difficult to get the audiences in. So that's the main problem because I mean from one one side it feels like it shouldn't be expensive to be able to create to create mm -hmm. uh, and movies are mm -hmm. making a movie is very expensive even like the movie that, that counts as a low budget movie very often has like seven figure budget or eight figure budget <laughs> Uh, that's why, like, it's great that you can you can put on a play for like one like one k investment, which still for some of us is big money. I mean, <laughs> it is, <laughs> uh, but you can like you can you can do it. But that's the problem that then there is no, you have no idea what it's going to be as a like theater goer. Exactly. Like you have no idea what you're signing up for. Like it's not a lot of money. Usually, it's like you'd like. 9, 10, 15 pounds probably for a ticket, which is not that much. But if you go often, like at some point you realize like, I've seen a lot of shit. Maybe next time I'll pay 20 extra, but go to something that has some kind of quality control. Exactly. And that's the problem. Like uh, right now, it doesn't feel like um, there's this fun environment of playful experimentation in fringe that would uh, uh, that would bring in the youth, that would bring in the people who just want to be excited or challenged. Mm -hmm. It's always people who have a big plan or just want to do one specific thing their way. And if people like it or not, it doesn't matter. So you either get people who are, oh, I want to be a director. What do I do? I just, pres I just need to do A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. stick. I did a French play and there's not a lot of passion in it. Mm. There is, it's, it's really difficult because London sucks the life out of you. It's true. <laughs> so getting this buzz of excitement of, ooh, the way the fringe was in the 90s or the way that Dublin was in the early 2000s, the way that Edinburgh was at first. It's Edinburgh again, it's more like stand-up comedy. So one person, so it's not the kind of drama, tragedy, comedy that I would be working on. It's sure there is space for it. But yes, I digress. We are at the end of times. 
<laughs> and you understood that, but you were nine. I remember. Uh, basically, but you produced all three runs because when this play you had like first small like two performances at uh, etc. Yes. Then you had how many performances, two performances in, in, cockpit. in cockpit, and then you had like a full run three weeks, two? three weeks, three weeks at Barons Court Theatre. Yes, I've seen all of them, and you produced all of it. Was any of the runs profitable? No. No, you lost money. Every single time, more and more and more money. Not lost, invested. Yes. Lost. Uh, you lost money on all of them. Can you tell me pros and cons of the experience now when you did that? Do you regret doing, like, producing your play in such a way and in the result? And is there any like any good or bad things that came out of it for you? Um, I do not regret the first two nights. Mm -hmm. But what I would suggest is don't listen to people. <laughs> Absolutely no, I don't listen to me. Uh, <laughs> It is stop stop listening to the podcast. Bad. Turn it off. <laughs> no, I'm just, please don't. <laughs> and the first um two shows, I learned everything I could learn from this specific piece. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's all I needed. Then you have to let go. What do you mean like all you need? Like the, there is a part of part of learning and having it like as one of the you know step stones for you but another part of creating a play is like wanting more people to see it because that's why you actually created it and with more runs more people saw it not really okay <laughs> <laughs> so it was mostly me just calling her and yes. <laughs> it was andre <laughs> uh, we did not really get people who were not originally like the numbers are like so sad like in the first two day run, we had maybe a hundred people, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a few more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the cockpit run that we paid so much money for. Yeah, but I mean, like to be fair, cockpit, I performed there uh, uh, in Master Margarita, uh, which was but that was actually a very successful run. It was my very first theater uh, experience, proper, like not not counting showcases. Uh, and we had four nights, and almost all four nights on so the cockpit. Like it's it's the whole theater. It's like the stage, like the stage is surrounded by audience. So like In for the all four, for, 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 for like all four sides is audience. But we had we only had audience from three sides, and one of them, like one of the size where like we removed the seats uh, and it was I think about on three sides I think it's about 150 people and I think from all four performances that we did uh, almost all four were full, were full but again it's there is not so much theater was going on in London in Russian there are, like, there are a couple of companies who do that did at least i'm not sure if they're still doing it uh there's not so many companies and there's not so many performances people can catch and it was master margarita which yeah. is based on book of like one of the most kind of famous uh books in russia at least <laughs> it's a great theater. like i really like the theater in, in general like i think it's like it's a really creative space it's hard to perform sometimes when you're kind of surrounded by people uh but i it's no wonder it's, it's what's expensive <laughs> What I'm saying is that it's a great uh, theatre. You learn a lot performing either in the thrust or in the round. They should not allow um, Camden French companies to book it. Because, because it's, it's, yeah, I think it's maybe it's too expensive. I think they lose, like they, I understand them. They lose money when people, like when there's no one performing that. <laughs> no one goes to see theatre in London in August. That's why there's the Camden French. Mm -hmm. So Campton Fringe makes money for mm -hmm. those venues, mm -hmm. while it makes the performers lose money. 
Amazing. That's a good deal. <laughs> that year, it was especially apparent mm -hmm. because after the pandemic, a lot of the venues were trying to stay alive and make up for the loss. So there were some very intense contracts. Mm -hmm. I think that things are starting to stabilize again and you can get venues that I had to pay so much for completely on profit share. Mm -hmm. So it might be better time to do things now. But for me, for that, putting a completely new work that had no reviews, that basically no one tried to promote apart from me, mm -hmm. was a catastrophically bad decision. And also like, it's not just the new, like new work. You were also like an author that was completely new it was your first place so no one knew who you like no one knew who you are no one had no like, no one had no idea what to expect from it as well so yeah every person in the show were newcomers director actors mm -hmm. etc so yeah it was a very very beautiful production i think in the cockpit like there was a lot of effort that went into it uh, I shouldn't have done it. Mm. I would not recommend Camden Fringe unless it is a profit share. And I would recommend putting on shows any other time apart from August. <laughs> like, just try to see what are the most easy months. Like, don't make it hard for you. Mm -hmm. And then don't do three-week run directly after. Like, I was... I was having talks with producers and the people that know things. And they're like, no, no, no. Camden Friends would boost the run. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Unless you are the one or two shows that are so monumentally different, like Cats the Musical as a solo performance that was it, it It was the standout of, that, of our year because it was so mad. Mm -hmm. that there were press articles about this, this, that. Unless you are that one standout show, then it does not really boost your sales. It just reduces the amount of people that will come see it the third time, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I do believe when you have, when you're starting, don't become precious about your work. Your first work will not be your first, your best work. Okay? It's your first work. Learn what you can from it reduce the cost, reduce the investment, just put it on for a couple of nights. That's more than enough to see the difference between the two nights and experiment with a couple of things. And then let go of it and use the money that you have to create something completely different in six months or a year. So what is the easy way to do the play then? What do you want to achieve? Mm -hmm. Are you the writer, are you the director, or are you the actor? Mm -hmm. The easiest way, all of it. <laughs> I would say, as a writer, give your work away. Stay the heck away from the product. Mm -hmm. There are absolutely so many actors out there and potential directors that would be grateful to get a new piece of writing and push it and wash your hands clean. Do not try to be involved in the process. You want the credits as a writer, just give your work away. Yeah. As a writer, you should be trying to take part of competition constantly. You should be trying to get into the development project, uh, development. Um, there's development opportunities, usually for younger people. Mm -hmm. With um, whether it is old vague or young vague, there is a lot of things on Twitter. Join all the communities. Try to find out new voices, different projects, incubator projects, and so forth, programs. As a writer, that's the easiest and fastest way that you can get your work out there. Do not try to be your own director. You are a writer. Maybe later on in your career, that would be a great thing to do. But for now, you are a writer. Focus on doing the writing the best you can. I... I don't know many success stories, and we're not talking about Fleabag, where one person does everything. If you, if you are specifically writing your own voice as a one-woman show, 
go for it, do everything. But the majority of the people who are trying to be writer directors are not writing a one woman, so they will perform. Mm-hmm. So just let go of it. As a writer, you have way much better chances. Just keep writing constantly. Give away your work. Try to see, perform, try. There is always submission windows in bigger theatres, Hampstead Theatre. Honestly, you will mostly just be judged by the quality of your work. So how does it work? Like you as a writer, like is there like just a theatre company who they just ask writers to send them their place and they choose from? There are some theatres that just want script. Mm-hmm. Whether that's the Bush Theatre or the Hampstead Theatre, do your own research. But it's on the website. Mm-hmm. So there's a hundred, I have, a, I've created a spreadsheet. There's those theatres in London. Mm-hmm. Do they accept scripts? Do mm-hmm. they accept plays? What do they want? So you write out, you see when are the submission windows, etc. Then you have smaller companies on Twitter, Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Uh, they're always having collides for writing submissions. Because the work of the writer is the most thankless one and uh, it's actually the easiest one to actually monetize. So there is a lot of empty spaces for new script mm-hmm. as long as you don't want to direct or act in them. Or be paid. But as an actor, pretty hard to get cast anywhere. Yeah. Even, Even if there is no pay. It's, it's, it's insane, yeah. So if you compare writing and acting, writing is so much easier. I don't know. I mean, there are, there's a lot of writers as well. Would you submit for a scratch night? Would you submit? Like, this is the early stages. We're talking about early stages. Yeah. Early stage submissions for writing, so much more easier to get seen than early stage submissions for acting. Mm-hmm. That is the challenge. But uh, what I'm going to say is directing is, again, a completely different kettle of fish. There is a lot of openings for directors compared to everything else. For first-time directors? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. You can, there is so many scratch nights. There are scratch nights in probably every second pub theatre. How... I mean, in a way, I mean, like, how do you get a job as there? As an actor, I understand you do the audition. As a writer, you write a piece and someone looks at it and says like, oh, that's shit, but well, that's the only thing we have. And then, but as a director, how do you audition, especially in the very beginning of your career? You just show up. And they're like, yeah, this one will do. Really? As long as you do not aggressively mess it up, as long as you do not actively antagonize people, you can have an entire career in directing by just being on a chair. Mm. Being... Try to be angrier. <laughs> it's easy to be a bad director floating around in the fringe world. Yeah. It's true. No, I mean, look, no, I, I, I understand that. I just don't understand why would you want to be But <laughs> that is why we have a lot of writer directors mm. because then it becomes the I have a vision. Yeah. I have a perfect vision that encapsulates ABC. I can say all these things because I am a writer and a director and I have directed other people's work. And it is actually difficult to be a good director. Being a good director is difficult because you have to be a therapist. You have a to be a cheerleader, you have to be the person watching the time. Or totalitarian, just like... No, <laughs> like that's... No, I isn't. will not accept that being a totalitarian is being a good director. As someone who was acting in the play that you wrote, mm-hmm. and at the same time being directed by someone else, how does it feel like? When someone directs you as an actor in the piece that you played, but like with their own vision. I love it. If anything, I would, I prefer firmer directors that mm-hmm. actually have a very specific idea that can be completely different than mine. 
mm-hmm. I, I would like, okay, if you bring me a director that's like, um, and now I'll do a fart joke here. <laughs> so it goes like, well, actually, I don't think I would mind that. <laughs> Good. I mean, come on, fart jokes can be funny. What's not funny about fart? Th- there's definitely fart situations. Um, I mean, it diffuses the pressure. This. I, I'm, 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 I'm having ideas now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the whole play is one woman show and it's all fart. It's fart. <laughs> it's one, one long fart. Sorry, we digress. Uh, very, very cultured people here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, the, being directed in your own work is, I do not, I was very lucky to actually come from the theoretical arts and performance background, because very early on you learn about the death of the author. Mm-hmm. That means the moment you create something, it's no longer yours. The person who watches it, in the best case scenario, will own it. And then it will become their story and then they will interpret it through their own lens. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing, I I write, I self-publish so much work and then people are like, oh my gosh, this and this means that. And I'm like, absolutely not. But I absolutely love the fact that it has taken a new life and it means something completely different for you. Like I had uh, people who came to me after the show and they were like, oh my gosh, Mike, is a metaphor for this and it means this and that. And I'm like, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I am so smart. I I put in all those things. Are you kidding? I am a genius. Of course not. That is why being directed on your own play is amazing because someone will see it with a lens of a person that has different life experiences. And then there will be bits and bobs in the finished product that people from all different works of life can empathize with. That's why I believe in a more collaborative process rather than a less collaborative one. Yeah, I agree. To, to a degree, I would say, because um, like there is there should be someone who, who makes decisions in, in like in the end. It can be a collaborative process to a degree, but then there should be someone who will make decisions. Otherwise, it's like collective Bullshit. Yeah. One voice on set. Mm-hmm. One voice on set. Mm-hmm. Like that's why writer and director needs to be different and the writer cannot really be in the room while the director is doing the work. I don't know. It, it depends. It depends. How, like I, to a degree, I disagree with that though, because I think when the writers are basically in charge in, in TV, we get like some very, very great shows when directors start interpret some of their writers uh, writing on films and they don't actually collaborate with writers sometimes they misinterpret some things that are very important there is no one on set next to them to tell them that actually that was on purpose this line is very important because if we don't have this line how the film doesn't make sense no when it comes to that, I completely agree with the show. It's especially because like we're talking about a play, it's one hour, it's two hours, depending. Uh, it's good to have the conversation with the writer. It's good for the writer to show up during the rehearsals and have an opinion, but they cannot both be on the set of course. at the same time. Yeah. But when we're talking about show running a big series, oh yeah, then you need a lot of eyes because there is different people doing different things. Like I have worked on pilots, smaller things, things that we did as a collective. Mm -hmm. And that's when you want more voices, but each person having a very specific part, continuity, character arc, specifically directing for cinematography, directing for performances. There's so many things that we can do, yes. Yeah. It was a good time. I remember when we were doing partly rotten. It was good. It was good. I still use one of the scenes of, from it in my showreel. <laughs> I enjoyed that so much. And that is what I'm going to say. Like when you want to create your own work, you need to do it a few times. 
Mm -hmm. Don't invest all your life's earnings. Try to start small. Uh, I still really, really appreciate the fact that I would meet up with people who I met in um, acting classes and we would meet up at my house once a week and then we would record monologues or scenes with each other or write the scenes for each other because that is how you learn. That is, you cannot just rely on going to one university, one acting school, and then the work will appear. If you're lucky, it will. But I feel like a massive part of becoming better is actually doing it in a small scale. Uh, I think massive part of it is like it's not about doing it on a, on, a, on a small scale. It's about doing it and doing it again and again and again and again. If you can do it on a big scale again and again and again, then well, of course, do it. But <laughs> then you'll have to be a rock father. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I agree with you. That's that's one of the one of the big problems I think that actors have. Ninety um, percent of the actors who don't work all the time. Mm-hmm. The only way to work on your craft is acting class. Yeah. Like, because you have to act to become better or stay good <laughs> or stay decent <laughs> actor. You have to perform all the time. And the only way to do it, unless you kind of like perform in front of your family every night, which again, like I don't think it will help you, to be fair. Uh, you, you need like, it's, it's acting class. You can't work as an actor all the time. It's one of the professions when you really depend so much on people who will give you work. Yeah. I mean, like maybe you can perform every day in front of the mirror, but again, I don't think it will help. <laughs> there is the motivation as well. Mm-hmm. Like uh, acting, even for screen, has a lot to do with feedback, has a lot to do with like the other actor you're in the scene with. Uh, Not a lot. It's so funny because I used to be a person that envisioned the perfect work environment to be in absolute seclusion. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in an industry where I actually thrive when it is creating work with other people. So people change. But uh, that's why... There is this gray area of acting, which is the immersive theater, the immersive experiences. And you can gain so much from that because you see the reaction of the crowd. You see the reaction of the other actors. Mm -hmm. You get the chance to experiment. And then you do that like for five, ten shows every week. So you gain a lot of hard skills like that. What they will tell you in acting classes is, I cannot necessarily fix your volume. Or I cannot necessarily fix some of your bad habits because those are the habits that you just need to practice. And there is a part of the acting journey which is like, yeah, rehearse every day by yourself or learn one script by yourself a week and then record it and see how it looks like. That is why there are some uh, programs uh, like self-taping programs where you can take online. Mm -hmm. And they're priceless because you get... Okay, it's not the perfect experience by far because it's always better to be in the room with other people on stage, uh, in on set. But just doing this self-taping over and over and over again, watching it back, you learn so much. Yeah, the only, I think one problem with that can be like, it's not like a problem, it's still better than doing nothing. But why you need someone you need a teacher because you might make some mistakes that you don't understand their mistakes or even like you would think that that's what you need to do and then you would get in the habit of doing those right. mistakes and like and repeating them so many times that and there is no one to tell you like no no don't do that no <laughs> all of the above is in combination with acting classes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, it's very easy to develop bad habits in acting, even if you're observing other Mm -hmm. actors. It's it's bad to observe other actors, actually, because then you're trying to emulate what they're doing. Just observe real life at this point. It is good to observe other actors, but you need to understand what exactly you're observing. 
and what do you need to learn from them? Because you might learn the really kind of opposite of what you need. Instead of instead of learning from them that you need to be you, you will try to be them. <laughs> and you probably shouldn't do it. Exactly. I'm not an expert on acting, but I think it's... <laughs> just um, also, just saying, but if you have the opportunity to be Anthony Hopkins and not to be yourself, be Anthony Hopkins. Sure, but probably younger, yeah. uh, ideally. Because, you know, it's you know, if, if, if it's an option, be a younger version of Anthony Hopkins. Just because you have more time to be Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> because Anthony Hopkins has had all his life to be Anthony Hopkins. And he has a lot, I hope, a lot of, a lot of years in front of him. But if you want to be Anthony... Oh, okay. Are you trying to backpedal the fact that you just said that Anthony Hopkins is about to kick the bucket? No, but I, look, Anthony Hopkins is old. I don't know if he knew. The dude was old for like, you know, half my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord <laughs> he's an amazing actor <laughs> be yourself <laughs> unless you can be Anthony Hopkins then be Anthony Hopkins <laughs> oh, <girl. laughs> um, oh my gosh yes that's, that's it basically <laughs> try your best uh, have the full on realisation that if you do not have the British accent or the American accent, yeah. everything you do might just amount to nothing. <laughs> but the real treasure was the friends we made along the way. It's actually true. No, but to be fair, like, it's true. Like, maybe not treasure, but the valuable thing. <laughs> no, but one of the things, and I said it before, uh, that, like, I really appreciate about acting because there's a lot of things that you don't appreciate about acting. Yes. <laughs> but one of the things that you do is that you find like-minded people who are most of them, well, okay, not most of them, some people are not great, but people who stick <laughs> around are amazing, talented. They all can do some shit that you can't, at least I can't. Most of, you know, someone directs you know, not direct, directs other plays, yeah, writes yeah. their own plays, produces them, and do, does all the other stuff. Someone dances and sings. Someone does like I can barely walk straight line. And then you're kind of like, well, th those people are amazing. You just have to remember, like, you have something great in you too. Otherwise, it's it's very, very easy to drop down in a hole. Like, oh my god, everyone is so amazing. I can't do shit. <laughs> the one thing that you reminded me. There is a specific trap in being in a very overrepresented uh, casting bracket. Mm -hmm. Like there's eight females to two male actors to begin with. And then uh, lighter skin, dark hair, dark eyes. That's the majority. Mm -hmm. 25 to 35. Mm -hmm. So you're already in the most overrepresented casting bracket. Then you're European, whatever. So when you're in an overrepresented as in not very in demand place, there is a very big trap in being the creator of your own work because then people can very easily forget that you're an actor mm -hmm. and just approach you for all the other things. And then there will be the situation of like, oh, I would have asked you to act in something, mm -hmm. but I can much... I can very easily find someone else. But there's not a lot of producers who are willing to do it for free, basically. Mm. So that is a bit of a trap. And that is something that sucked the joy out of it for a while because I have produced other people's work. I have directed other people's work. Three, four, five different productions, plays, shorts. And while you learn from that, and if it is something that you want to do exclusively, that's fine. But as I said, if I was just trying to become a director, there is much easier ways to become a director. And if you want to be a producer, you can become a paid producer. It's easier. And then it becomes a situation where you just don't say no. Mm -hmm. And you end up doing, playing at the same ballpark, helping people constantly 
and realizing that they no longer perceive you as a performer because you are no longer doing the performing. What is next for you? Is there anything that you're working on right now? Therapy. Okay, <coughs> that's important. That's, that's, I'm not laughing. <laughs> it is important. It is very important. Yeah. Like, um, especially when you're working freelancing on things that um, don't have a health insurance mm-hmm. or don't have sick days off. It's always quite hard to prioritize your health and mental health and everything. So that's a massive topic that we're not even going to touch. Uh, Next time. Yes. Uh, Just mental health (laughs) podcasts with a lot of ice cream. The mental health for actors. Yes. Uh, What I think is super important is um, mm, I have a few plays that I have written. I have specifically a play that is a um, female retelling of uh, the Iliad. It's uh, weird. <laughs> we love weird. It's very gay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so? It's, um, yeah, it is a very, it's something that I'm very passionate about, but also I know that it's quite a big undertaking. So at the moment, um, I might just go and do something simpler. I was using the past year to recuperate from working on so many. Mm. (laughs) I I did five (laughs) French productions in a year and I was like, I cannot do this anymore. It's not sustainable. I wonder why. So if I do something, it will be a scratch night. Mm -hmm. short script a couple of factors just for the joy of it Mm -hmm. uh still audition i still work on um, improving my craft i work at immersive experience so there's a lot of acting (laughs) and i think i'll go back to trying to submit some of my screenplays this year as well Mm. they did pretty well in the bbc contest that time yeah. Last time, yeah, they were long listed, not short listed, long listed. Mm. Uh, so that is something I'm quite passionate about. That's good. I really hope that it will pay out because it's time. Honestly, it's time. Come on. <laughs> uh, as, as hard as you were working like for the last few years, like it's time for you to get something that you deserve. We will see about that. Okay. Are you ready for Blitz round? Yeah. Texting or talking? Texting. Cats or dogs? Both. Hmm. Your one guilty pleasure? Writing. It's not so guilty. At 4 a.m. instead of sleeping. All right. What makes you laugh? Bad jokes. What makes you angry? Life. <laughs> Do you have any nicknames? None I can disclose publicly. I have a, I have a writing monikers. I have a painting monikers. Like I was, yeah. <laughs> okay. What dish do you cook best? Anything that you can just put in the oven and forget about them until you can start smelling it burn. Okay. <laughs> alien or aliens? The movie. Of course. Alien, because it's the first one, obviously. Okay. Uh, your favorite character in any fictional story, book, screen, or video game? Vegeta from Dragon Ball. <laughs> there was a lot of character journey. Either that or uh, Alexander the Great. He's not <laughs> fictional. I, <laughs> well, he might as well be. <laughs> he might as well be. I mean, like, there's everything that we know about him. Is probably like not everything, but some some of it yeah. is fictional. Or so, the so. little prince from Little Prince. Okay. But Jonathan Livingston Seagull from Jonathan Livingston Seagull. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next question: <laughs> Star Wars or the Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings. Uh, do you have any unknown or unexpected talents? I mean, I can paint. I can program. I can write pretty well. I can edit people's work. Um, Uh, How often do you cry? I don't very often. Like I go through periods, like when I'm actually sad in my life, I don't cry very often. And that's where 
fiction comes in because then it is easier to cry watching. That's why I love storytelling. It is a mirror of our life and actually it is way easier to process your emotions when you watch something on screen or where you read about something versus being like, oh, my life sucks. <laughs> Tears. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I cry like a little baby when I'm watching something, even when I know like it's, it's like in series or films or books or games, even when I know like, oh my God, this scene is so cheesy. <laughs> and then I start crying. Crying? Like I don't very often cry about my life. It's and there is a lot <laughs> to cry about. It's just too difficult to process mm. when it is, yeah. It's, it's, it's they're very complicated emotions when it's in your own life, when it's your own grief. Mm. It is very difficult to process. While when you're uh, consuming it on TV or screen or anything. You have like, you almost like have permission. It's not about you. It is very easily accessible. Mm -hmm. The grief. It's yeah. great. Delicious. I just rewatched the last episode of Hannibal last night because a friend of mine was watching and was like, oh, I would like a cheeky cry. <laughs> All right. How can people reach you if they want to work with you? Uh, Instagram. I think it's the best way to reach me at demi.acts, as in the action of acting, demi acts. Mm -hmm. Is there one cool thing? Is there anything that you like and you think our viewers should try it too? Online communities, hyper-specific online communities now hear me out i have been part of like screenwriting groups screenplay groups uh i've gone to london like uh, classes whatever and then you find a hyper specific super excited amateur online community on a forum mm -hmm. and immediately you get back the passion and excitement that a lot of times is stripped away by the very goal-oriented approach mm -hmm. that you see if you're in real life in a class or something like that. All right. All right. So if you're interested in something, find a small community online and it will reignite your passion for something if you lost it. Find your tribes yeah. anywhere. Like it can be outside in Hackney where people just play drums and smoke weed or it can be in a little weird corner of the internet just have fun <laughs> <laughs> all right Linda, thank you so much it was fun i uh, love the conversation and i hope we'll have something to talk about very soon something more specific maybe some projects or some roles or some books or anything